Okay, here we are. It is Thursday, April 1st, 2021. How quickly a year goes by. Uh, tonight is part three of our four part special series on the Holy Week activities. Just to recap, we've already done parts one and two. Mm -hmm. We looked uh, last week at what? The 69 weeks of Daniel and the triumphal entry of Jesus. Then we went down to South Beach on Saturday and Saturday, this past Saturday, was the beginning of Passover, as it were, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the next day after that was actually Palm Sunday. So, uh, you know, and, and here we are. This is the Thursday is, yeah. of the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus. And we're going to talk about why it's a Thursday and not a Friday. Mm -hmm. No good Friday. It's a Thursday that Jesus was crucified. And then, of course, this coming Sunday will be... Resurrection Sunday, which uh, frequently in, in uh, Catholicism and nominal Christianity is referred to as Easter, and we'll talk about reasons why we don't use the term Easter as well. So I think to be helpful, I know we have a number of, of viewers out on uh, our YouTube page, uh, South Beach Gospel Ministries, uh, on YouTube and Facebook, so like and subscribe if you haven't already. I know we even have a, a number of pastors that kind of tune in and uh, and watch and particularly watch this series and the series we just completed the five-week series on the book of Daniel um, and the prophecies of the book of Daniel as it relates to the Antichrist which ended with the 69 weeks of Daniel and then we picked up this series with the triumphal entry which is also known as Palm Sunday which was the terminal date of the 69 weeks of the year's prophecy and so for those of you guys that have to explain this kind of stuff to your congregations, your flocks, or the people that you're evangelizing or whoever you're discipling, it might be easier if we pretend instead of this being 2021, April 1st, let's pretend it's 32 AD. If this were 32 AD, then this past Sunday would have been Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and was hailed by the crowds as the Messiah. Blessed be the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Remember, and the mm -hmm. Pharisee said, Rabbi, tell your followers not to say that. And he said, if these remain silent, the very rocks would cry out. And we talked about, why would the rocks cry out? Because today was the day. Mm -hmm. What day? Palm Sunday? No, it was the 173,880th day after the degree of Artaxerxes Longimanus that was prophesied to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 and 26. Remember, we found out that Daniel received from Gabriel a prophecy of the 70 weeks prophecy, which would be divided out into two sections. The first 69 weeks of the years would be from the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus, which we find out now occurred, we know historically from archaeological records, occurred on Nisan 10 of 445 BC. Daniel received the prophecy a little bit before that, several years before that, so he wrote it down in the book of Daniel, and so that everybody would know when this decree is made, then Israel could count forward 173,880 days, which Sir Robert Anderson, a mathematician, a Christian, and an investigator, chief investigator for Scotland Yard in the 1800s, checked all the observational and, uh, you know, uh, data related to timing at Greenwich, you know, Greenwich Mean Time is that place right. in Greenwich, England, where, you know, all the clocks of the world are based on. And he was able to determine that that time from the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus on Nisan 10 of 445 BC, if you count it forward, 483 years or 69 weeks of years, it would land you exactly on Nisan 10 of 32 AD. So if we were right now in 32 AD, then Jesus would have ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey this past Sunday, and he had just raised Lazarus from the dead, which you can kind of look at in, in Luke, the Gospel of Luke. You got four Gospels, three of them are similar, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's why they're called the Synoptic Gospels. Mm -hmm. And then you have John, which is standalone, because it adds so much more additional information. Um, but if you if you look at that, you'll see Lazarus was just raised from the dead after four days. And, you know, parenthetically, just give you, I know it's supper time, but, you know, just give you a little detail, having gone to a number of autopsies as a prosecutor over the course of my career, I can say to you that 
back then they didn't have formal, formaldehyde and they didn't have uh, you know uh, mortuaries where you know you drain the bodily fluids and you put in embalming fluid so back in Jesus's day after a body's been dead for about a day or so the the fluids inside the body begin to ferment and putrefy mm. and basically gases build up and after a couple of days the body's going to explode under the pressure of all the gases building up and liquids and fluids are going to start seeping out of the different bodily orifice and it's going to smell horrific putrefaction and fermentation the smell of death god wanted us to understand the seriousness of death and so that's why when jesus uh, had been told initially your friend Lazarus is sick when he was in Bethany which was right down the street from where Lazarus lived in his mansion because he was a wealthier guy um, Jesus didn't come and he didn't come on purpose he waited four days and by the time he got there Lazarus had just died you know four days earlier and his sister said look if you had come when we asked you to you might have been able to work a miracle and say but he's been dead you know for like four days now he said take away the stone but he's been dead for four days meaning when we open the tomb, not only are you going to be disappointed that you're not going to be able to raise it, but we're going to be offended by the stench of a body that is in the process of decay and has exploded with the fermenting juices of a dead body. And so she said, you know, you know, do you believe that I'm, you know, the son of man? He said, you know, if you believe, and she said, you know, I believe that you're the one, you know, that the Messiah, that it was coming into the world. And so, by faith, they went ahead and moved the stone out of the way, and Lazarus was raised from the dead. Now, a bunch of the people that were at Lazarus' estate, when he raised Lazarus from the dead after four days, there was no mistake about it. This guy wasn't swooning. He didn't pass out. Clearly, the body should have been in decay. And even if he hadn't died of whatever it was that killed him, being trapped in a cave with a stone over it, he would have suffocated to death a few hours later, so he would have been dead either way. No way that Lazarus was coming out of there if he wasn't dead. So the guys that were present were also present a few days later when Palm Sunday occurred. And Palm Sunday, as it turned out, is now commemorated as the day the palm fronds were waved because when Jesus rode into Jerusalem to start that special Holy Week that year, Nisan 10 was a special day because in the book of Exodus, it was related to the Passover celebration. We looked at that last week. In Exodus chapter 12, all kinds of special things had to relate to the Passover. And we talked about on, Sun, on Saturday when we did our uh, live teaching down on South Beach, how Jesus didn't eat the Passover. He was the Passover. And so we, we listed all the reasons why the Passover lamb would have to be presented to the priests of the temple on Nisan 10, because Exodus 12 said so, and then they'd observe it for four days. So if this is 32 AD, Jesus, being the Passover lamb, presented himself to the temple on Nisan 10, had the whole big fight with the, you know, the Pharisees about money changers in the temple, and said, you know, you, you'll not see me here again, not till you learn to cry, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the Messianic Psalm. That all happened this past Sunday on Palm Sunday which was also the 173,880th day after the decree of Artaxerxes Lanyamanus in fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 26, that it would be 69 weeks of years or 483 years to the day that the Messiah would be presented to do what? Be installed as king of Israel? No. no. To be karat or cut off or killed, not for himself, it says in, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, because if he had to die for his own sins, then he couldn't be the substitutionary sacrifice. Because we learned from Exodus 12, the Passover lamb has to be spotless and pure, Steve. That's why you would watch him from Nisan 10 to Nisan 14 to give the priests time to examine to make sure there wasn't one here that was discolored. It had to be white, which was a symbol of purity. And so Jesus comes into Jerusalem on Nisan 10, which again, if this is 32 AD, is last Sunday. And so... Under the rules of Exodus, you had to count four, 14 day, four days until Nisan 14. Now, Nisan 14, what would you do? Towards the end of the day. And right now, it's about what, Steve? What time do we got? It's about, it's, you know, almost 7 o'clock. 
Sun is still up here in Miami Beach, but it'll be going down in a few minutes. So if this is 3280, right now is Nissan 14. And in a few minutes, when the sun goes down, 20 minutes from now, it'll click over in the Nissan 15. And so at this period of time, right now, if this were 3280, Jesus would just be getting buried. They would be finishing up hurriedly, taking Jesus' body down from the cross. He would have, after presenting himself on Palm Sunday, or the 69th week of Daniel, on Sunday, he would have been arrested after the Last Supper, which was not the Passover, but the meal the night before Passover, which I, I've used the sort of the colloquialism on Christmas Eve, as opposed to Christmas Day, Christmas Eve dinner is the preparation for the Passover we see depicted in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. That upper room discourse with Jesus, and we're going to look at that in a little bit, Jesus revealed all these interesting new doctrine um, was given during that upper room discourse at the Last Supper, which was not the Passover, but was the night before the Passover, the preparation for the Passover. And if you look in the Gospel of John, it makes it clear because it mentions you know, like four or five times. It was the preparation for the Passover. So Jesus would have earlier today had celebrated his last supper with his disciples earlier in the day. And he would have, uh, you know, actually it would have been, you know, you know, yesterday, it would have been the preparation for the Passover, um, the day starting at sundown. When they started that meal, it would have been Nissan 13. So you could look at it really as kind of Wednesday night um, into Thursday. For us, Thursday would begin at midnight. But for them, Wednesday would turn into Thursday at about sundown. So when they started the Last Supper, it was Nissan uh, 13. But when dessert was served, after it got dark, it was already Nissan 14. And it was after that Last Supper where the upper room discourse was given, that Jesus then left the upper room, went to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was betrayed by Judas and arrested. And after being arrested, he was subjected to six illegal trials, several of which were at nighttime. And under the law of Moses, you can't have a trial during the night. And so Jesus would have been arrested probably sometime around three o'clock in the morning in the Garden of Gethsemane and taken to uh, begin a series of six trials. And that would have happened, let's say, if this is neat, if this is 32 AD, it would have begun at about three o'clock this morning. Mm -hmm. Jesus would have left his last supper, gone to the Garden of Gethsemane, been betrayed by Judas, been arrested by the temple guards, and taken immediately to the first of a number of trials. And it would have still been night out, it would have still been dark out, it would have been Nissan 14, mm -hmm but it would have been about three in the morning for us and it would have been dark out. And the first of the illegal trials, because you can't have a trial under the law of Moses in the dark, would have been him being taken to the house of Annas, who was the high priest preceding the current high priest, Caiaphas. And he also happened to be the father-in-law of the current high priest, Caiaphas. Caiaphas married his daughter. There was a lot of political incestuousness yeah. and uh, amongst the high priestly families and amongst Rome who benefited from being able to control the Sanhedrin of the Jewish Supreme Court. And they benefited by getting Rome to endorse their candidacies for high priests. So these guys were the religious elite. And the religious elite, as we know, when we look at the Vatican, we look at you know, the Roman church, we see you know, all kinds of ecclesiastical tomfoolery going on. The more ecclesiastical and worldly your religious organization becomes, the less godly and biblical it becomes. So, okay, at about 3 a.m. in the morning, the reason why I'm laying it out so that it'll be easier for those of you guys that are out there that take it upon yourself to help explain these things to other people, you'll be able to picture it in your mind if you place yourself, yeah. not 2021 anymore, it's not April 1st, 2020, it's 32 AD. Now, at about three o'clock this morning, Jesus is arrested, taken to the house of Annas. After the illegal trial at Annas' house, he sent to his uh, son-in-law's house, Caiaphas, where another illegal trial is being held. The current high priest of Israel, Caiaphas, holds another trial. Mm -hmm. And it's there where Jesus is questioned and Jesus is placed under oath 
and you can see this in detail in the Gospel of John. He's placed under oath and he says, you know, there's all this conversation about who you are and whatever. And this Caiaphas had already met with the Sanhedrin, uh, you know, probably several weeks earlier. Remember when Jesus started doing these miracles and they said, oh, the whole world has gone after him. And when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, last Sunday on Palm Sundays, many of the people that were present when he raised Lazarus from the dead, saw him riding in on the donkey and started shouting out the Messianic Psalm from Psalm 118, verse 26. Blessed be the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And that freaked out the, the, the high priest and the former high priest in the Sanhedrin because they said, the whole world has gone after this man. We got to do something about this. And they had already decided, you know, weeks, months earlier, that it is expedient, Caiaphas said, that one man died, that the nation perish, perisheth not. Because they said, at the very least, if the people acknowledge him as the king of Israel, then the Romans are going to come in and take away our temple, and, parenthetically, we'll, we'll lose our high-paying religious uh, elite jobs, and we won't be uh, lording over the people anymore, so we can't allow this to happen because of our own personal self-interest. We don't care about Bible prophecy and whether God is fulfilling the promise that he made centuries ago to our fathers that he was going to send the Messiah. So they decided, Caiaphas said, it's better to kill him than let the whole nation perish. Not because he did anything wrong, but now they've, they've got an excuse because Caiaphas places them under oath. I adjure you by the name of the living God. Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And now that Jesus is under oath, he can't dance out of the answers because... Um, you know, we, we see in essence that Jesus was giving interesting answers to them, but you could interpret them different ways. When, once he's placed under oath, you know, I mean, because when, when they first began questioning him, he said, you know, well, who are you? Are you the Messiah? He said, listen, you know, every day you saw me in the temple and you didn't arrest me, you didn't ask me, you know, and I, I spoke openly in the temple right. on a daily basis. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me. You know, instead of trying to defend himself, he was like, you know what I said. And so one of the guards slapped him in the face and said, oh, answer us thou the high priest so? In other words, don't back talk the high priest. And Jesus responds. And it's kind of similar because Paul was put through the same thing. He says, if I've said something in error, then point out the error. Yeah. But if I just spoke the truth, then why do you hit me? They didn't have an answer to that. Then the high priest said, I adjure you. I'm placing you on their oath. In the name of God, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And Jesus responds with that two-word answer, I am, which was the divine name of God in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And, uh, you know, I was looking at, you know, one of the uh, theologians that writes notes and comments in some of these Bible commentaries, and I forgot, the, the when, when you look at, for instance, King James translator, add an italicized he, yeah. the prepositional you know, imperative. And this note and comment said, you know, in the Greek text is receptive, the prepositional imperative is missing. Yeah. He intentionally didn't say, I am he. He intentionally only said, I am, so as to force the conclusion that he was invoking the divine name of Yahweh. And it was at that point they said, oh, he's guilty of blasphemy. What, what more do we need to hear him? We got to put him to death. And then they were like, well, Oh, that's right. We're under capital, uh, you know, uh, the rule of the Romans. About six months after Jesus was born, the Roman Empire, which had taken over this section of the world, Judea, had disallowed capital power of the Jewish Supreme Court, meaning just in time for the prophecy to be fulfilled, you know, before the scepter departs from out of Judah and a lawgiver between his feet, Shiloh shall come. And Shiloh was an idiom for the Messiah. So God couldn't allow Rome to strip Israel of the power to put men to death until after the Messiah was born. But then a few months after the Messiah was born, in about 4 BC, Rome stripped them of that power. So now that prophecy was fulfilled. Now they're like, remember in 4 BC, Rome, you know, said, you know, 36 years ago, they took away our power to put people to death. So they had to send him to a Roman governor for the Roman civil law to apply as opposed to the Jewish religious law. Um, and so they sent him to Pontius Pilate. So now we're talking about four or five in the morning. Today, Nissan 14 it is, 
Um, it's a Thursday. And so Pilate says, I don't have any interest in your religious disputes. Why are you getting me up at this time in the morning? To, he's from Gal He's a Galilean? Wait a minute. That's part of King Herod's uh, jurisdiction. And King Herod was, was part Jew. He was the son of uh, Herod the Great. Remember the guy who killed all the children in Judea? Bethlehem Ephrata, though you be the least amongst you, out of you shall come him that is to be called the Messiah. So he put to death all the kids up to two years of age because he knew that prophecy was about to be fulfilled and Jesus had to flee into Egypt with his family. Well, his son, the Herod uh, Antipas, is now the titular king of the Jews as appointed by Rome. He's not even really fully Jewish, so he's not a real king of the Jews. He's just a Roman puppet, if you will. And so Herod said, oh, I heard all kinds of stuff about you. So perform a magic trick for me, Jesus. I heard you could raise people from the dead, you could turn water into wine, you even walked on water. Can you do any of those things? And Jesus, having no respect for him, didn't even respond. When, when he is with Pontius Pilate, he's engaging in interplay with Pontius Pilate. But he doesn't even respond to Herod. Remember he had said earlier, you know, you go tell that fox, today and tomorrow I do miracles and heal the sick, and the third day I will be perfected, meaning, uh, you know, I'm going to be put to death and rise the third day. He kept saying it, but nobody, even his own disciples, understood what he was saying. So he totally ignores Herod, and Herod was like, ah, this guy's no fun. So he mocks him, and it's Herod that gives him the purple robe and a scepter and says, Hail, King of the Jews. And they make fun of him and they put a purple robe on him and they send him back to Pontius Pilate. So now you've had two trials. You had Annas and Caiaphas doing religious uh, trials at night. And then he had uh, Pilate doing his first of uh, uh, potentially three trials. And then he gets sent to Herod for yet another fourth trial. And then Herod sends him back to Caiaphas for the second of Caiaphas' three trials, and um, excuse me, to uh, Pilate, for the second of Pilate's three trials, and then Pilate, now facing him, is like, all right, uh, so I got to judge this guy. And Pilate, you know, if you read all four Gospels together, you'll find out that his wife had had a dream about Jesus, that he was a righteous man. And if you read throughout the Gospels, you see Pilate is desperately, desperately trying to get Jesus off the hook. Now, he apparently, unlike the Pharisees and the religious elite who are under the control of Satan, even though uh, Pilate is the governor of a pagan nation, he realizes he's in the presence of the majesty of God, and he's going out of his way to try to acquit Jesus of the accusations. And so he questions Jesus about certain things, and he says, I don't find any fault in him. And to mollify, you know, Caiaphas and Annas, who came to the outside of Pilate's house, but couldn't go into Pilate's house. Why? Because the Passover, which would be occurring right now, the sun is about to set. If this is 32 AD, Jesus is just being put in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and the Passover lambs throughout the land of Israel, which had been slaughtered at about 3 o'clock this afternoon when Jesus was still on the cross, they're now being cooked up in the ovens and about to be prepared for that Passover meal, which will be served right after sunset, which will be the beginning of Nisan 15th, right after the end of Nisan 14th, and will be the beginning of the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread. We're now on the fourth of the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which starts with the first meal being the Passover after sundown on the 14th at the beginning of uh, the day right after sunset on Nisan 15. So, Pilate, you know, is, is questioning him. He says, you know what, I'm going to send him out to be um, scourged. And he'll be whipped. And, you know, and I think he does it to make, you know, the Sanhedrin leaders, Caiaphas and Annas, and, and, and the delegation from the Sanhedrin feel sorry for Jesus. Okay, I beat him up, and now I'm just going to let him go. And so... They say to him, you know, you, he's claiming to be the king of the Jews. You know, this is, this is blasphemy. Under our law, you know, he is worthy of death. And Pilate says, I, I can't find anything, you know, 
worthy of death. So after he has him scourged, he brings him back in and has yet another uh, hearing or trial with Jesus. And that's when this interplay that is so interesting in John chapter 19, we don't have time to go through each one of the verses because we'd be here for three hours tonight. I know, you know, I'm trying to keep these in bite size, you know, uh, digestible amounts so that you guys can consume it and, and, and repeat it back to who you need to. So he says, you know, uh, I find no, no guilt or, in him and I don't find that he's guilty of anything worthy of death. So what Pilate does is starts to question him and he says, don't you realize that I have the power to crucify you or to have you set free? And Jesus said, you'd have no power at all if it weren't granted you from above. So Pilate is like, who is this guy? He's not even trying to save himself. <laughs> and so that you get into that whole interplay. And so he says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, I am. But as of now, my kingdom is not of this world. And, you know, he said, all who are of the truth listen to my voice. And Pilate asks him, what is truth? But I don't get the sense that he's being sarcastic. And I don't get the sense... That he's making fun of Jesus. I get the sense that he's worried that Jesus might be, in fact, some kind of divine deity, and he doesn't want to be responsible mm. for having put to death the Son of God. And so he's trying to come up with reasons not to, but Jesus won't let Pilate off the hook because Jesus' whole purpose in coming, Steve, was what? The whole mission of the first advent was to get yourself sacrificed for the sins of the world. And so he had to. And Jesus, being able to read hearts, he knew Pilate was going to use any excuse possible to get him out of there and to not have him crucified. So Jesus wouldn't give him an opportunity. But he did explain things to Pilate that he didn't explain to Herod because Pilate probably apparently seemed like a sincere seeker. I wouldn't be surprised when we get to the Father's house after the rapture that we see... King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonian kingdom, and a pagan, and Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Rome. And because it was very strange the way these individuals reacted to yeah. you know, the messengers and prophets of God, whether it be Daniel in Nebuchadnezzar's case, or Jesus and Pilate in John chapter 19. So, okay, the sun's going down. Pilate has now tried to get Jesus off the hook after three different addresses and sending him to Herod and after Pilate tells the Sanhedrin I find uh, him guilty of nothing you know and they, what do you want me to do with this man they crucify him crucify him and then Pilate invokes this special rule says, oh isn't there a rule that says that I can release a prisoner in light of the approaching Passover remember the Sanhedrin delegation couldn't go into Pilate's house to bring the charge against Jesus because the Passover hadn't been celebrated yet it was going to be celebrated later that night, so they couldn't go in, so they had to go out to the place called the pavement, or the porch, or Gabbatha in, in the Aramaic. And so uh, Pilate had to go to them. And it was there, he said, I find him, uh, you know, uh, no guilt in him, uh, nothing worthy of death. And so then he said, I'm going to leave it up to you guys. Who do you want? Barabbas? Now we know from the Gospels that Barabbas was both a robber, we find out in the Gospel of John, and a murderer, we find out in the Gospel of Mark. So, Pilate thinking there's no way they're going to vote yeah. on the eve of their high holy religious day for a robber and a murderer to be set free amongst them, as opposed to this miracle man, the rabbi who supposedly can heal people and does all these wonderful good works, mm -hmm. they're going to vote for Jesus and I'm off the hook. Well, the Pharisees, remember this, is, this hearing is going on, the last of these hearings going on probably at about 6 o'clock in the morning. So people aren't even up for work yet. And, and the Pharisees were able to plant their people in the crowd mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, not everybody was opposed to Jesus. Jesus was being hailed four days earlier as the Messiah and the King of Israel because of what he had just done with Lazarus' resurrection from the dead. But the Pharisees had time, yeah. since they had been orchestrating these illegal trials since 3 in the morning, to get their people in there. And they took a vote, and they all cheered, you know, for Barabbas louder than they cheered for Jesus. And so Pilate said, you know what, bring me a bowl. And he washed his hands in front of the whole crowd. He says, I'm washing my hands of the blood of this innocent man, Jesus. And then the high priest said, his blood be upon us and upon our children. And so they condemned themselves to the diaspora, which would be coming in a few decades, 
the destruction of the temple and God's anger at them from that time forward, but not forever, but only for a period of time. And so with that, Pilate, uh, you know, set a precedent, uh, unprecedented in the history of criminal justice, as I pointed out before. Uh, for the first time ever, after a criminal trial, the person who was acquitted was then sentenced to death after being acquitted of all the crimes. And so Jesus was then sent to be crucified, which would have begun after Pilate whipped him. Remember, his beard was torn out. And then the Roman soldiers wrapped him up in a scarlet robe and put a crown of thorns on him and put a reed on him. And they slapped him around some more, just like it had happened to him earlier when he was in front of uh, King Herod. And so that's where he gets the purple and the scarlet robes. And they slap him around, prophesy, who hit you? And all of these terrible things they're doing to Jesus prior to the beginning of the crucifixion. But then, uh, you know, several hours later at about 9 o'clock in the morning, he's then put on the cross. And we find out uh, three hours later, we find out that at the midway point, he's on the cross from about 3, uh, 9 in the morning to about 3 in the afternoon. And it was at this period of time throughout the land of Israel that the Passover lambs are being slaughtered throughout the land of Israel. And so um, Jesus is literally fulfilling what we talked about on Saturday. He was the Passover lamb. He couldn't eat the Passover because he was the Passover. And at the same time, the Passover lambs were getting killed ritualistically so that they could be sacrificed and offered up and eaten as the meal, which would begin in about 20 minutes from now as it's getting darker out. We're now crossing over out of the end of Nisan 14. Now Nisan 15 is going to approach. As soon as it gets dark enough out there, you can sort of look out the window and see over the Atlantic Ocean. We have some storm clouds. Like God sent it a beautiful sunny day all day until we start talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. And it's almost as if God has provided the special effects and sent cloud cover, thunderstorms, and clouds. We haven't had rain in like six months down here in Miami Beach. Well, that's what you had to do you know? day, right? And, and Steve, that, that's the same ways into my next point, Steve. <laughs> that from 3 o'clock to noon, that's just a typical beautiful day in Judea, mm -hmm. but at noon, God caused a supernatural event, a solar eclipse from noon to 3 p.m. You know, somebody said, you know, it was such a travesty that the Son of God was being killed, stripped naked and hung on a cross that, you know, God didn't, didn't want the universe to look at it, so he darkened the sky. So uh, Arthur Kessler, a very famous political scientist novelist, wrote a, wrote a, a novel, remember, you know, it was a political science major we had to read, called Darkness at Noon. And he stole that title from... The Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John, where God supernaturally caused from 12 noon to 3 uh, in the afternoon a solar eclipse. So that it became dark, just like it all of a sudden did, you know, after a beautiful day today. Mm -hmm. Here it is, all of a sudden become overcast and cloudy, and it started, you know, to rain. And, and so Jesus is now hanging on the cross till 3 p.m., and then at about 3 p.m., it's when Jesus says, those magical words, you know, first he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic for my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it's the first time that Jesus is now referring to God the Father, instead of referring to him as the Father as he always had, he refers to him as God, because now the relationship has been broken. It's as if God turns his back on Jesus, because Jesus is what? He's become sin, sin for us. Yeah. And so because he's become sin for us, which is in fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies, you know, in Numbers chapter 21, Moses lifted up the bronze serpent on a pole. And if you looked at it, you would be healed. That was the symbol of Jesus being crucified. Bronze being the symbol of God's judgment. A serpent being a symbol of sin. Um, Satan is the serpent lifted up on a pole was a supernatural hint that the Messiah was going to come to earth in the form of a man and be lifted up on a pole, which is what Jesus was, and the pole was in the shape of a cross. Yeah. And so then we see that uh, at 3 p.m., Jesus is hurriedly taken down. Why? Because the Passover is about to begin. The Passover won't begin until after sundown, Nisan 14, which will begin 
Nisan 15 in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so Jesus is now in the tomb um, and the Passover lambs are now in the oven and they're about to be served up as it's getting dark. And so with that, we'll let you open us up in a word of prayer, Steve, and we'll jump on and look at the chart and tell you why it was the Thursday crucifixion. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, for the chance for us as the, as the church to gather around again, Lord, to go back and look at what, uh, what those final few days were actually occurred, Lord, and what they mean for us as born-again believers, Lord, who have, who, who have accepted the, the gift that you've uh, made available to us all, salvation, Lord. We just pray that folks see this, um, see this video and also understand salvation, Lord, and, and also to take advantage of the, the gift that you've given us. We thank you. For the gift of the study, and thank you most for your son Jesus Christ in name. Pray, amen. All right, so what we're going to try to do and accomplish tonight with, with the time that we have, um, that was a little 30 minute introduction as to what we're looking at, is we're going to try to kind of look at the Last Supper. Um, there, are, there are four chapters alone 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, five chapters alone in the Gospel of John on the Last Supper, which is uh, the Upper Room Discourse. We could spend a week uh, on, on that topic. So. We'll just go through that and touch upon some of the major doctrine that's laid out there, and we'll then go into the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, which we just summarized, and the Thursday crucifixion. But um, I did make a chart, and I want to just, just to help us out, the importance of being able to make a determination that Jesus was crucified on a Thursday as opposed to a Friday, tomorrow, the Roman Catholic Church and much of the Protestant nominal church world will be acknowledging or celebrating, if you will, Good Friday, the day that Jesus was, uh, you know, crucified because of a misunderstanding mm -hmm. of a verse in the gospel that says they had to take the body down because the Sabbath was about to begin. So they say, oh, well, the Jewish Sabbath is Saturday. And it runs, you know, from sundown Friday until uh, sundown on Saturday, so since the Sabbath was about to begin, it had to be a Friday crucifixion. But the enemies of the gospel, somebody like a Richard Dawkins or some kind of bright scholar who's an atheist or an agnostic will say, but it does, doesn't it say in your Bible, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, that Jesus said, just as, you know, uh, Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so must the Son of Man spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so if you look at a Friday crucifixion, you quickly find out that no way, shape, form, or fashion, the way, no matter how you slice it up, you can't get three days and three nights from a Thursday crucifixion. So why don't you read that for us, Steve? Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. And we'll take a look at uh, the Passover and the Thursday crucifixion and uh, towards the end there, we'll talk about what was discussed at the Last Supper just prior to that. Matthew 12, uh, verse 40. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, so, and now we already looked last week, we looked at the strange rules and regulations that related to um, the Passover, and we saw that, and the sun's just going down now, so here we go, the clock is going click, 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 Nissan 14 is now over, yeah. and now we're starting Nissan 15. Okay, so remember, we looked last week when we were on South Beach on Saturday, we looked at the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and we looked at Exodus chapter 12, where we learned in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, 5 through 8, 11 through 14, 17 and 18, and verses 21 to 27. And for those of you that haven't seen that, just go to our YouTube page, South Beach Gospel Ministries, and take a look at our teaching from Saturday on the Passover Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I put a nice outline in there with all the verses tied in from the Old Testament to what Jesus was actually symbolizing as a picture or a type of the Passover. It was really, not only was it a comm commemorative of the exodus of Israel from out of slavery in Egypt for 400 years, but that in and of itself was something that God allowed to be a picture or a type of a much bigger reality that was coming. That would be the delivery of the nation of Israel and all the people of the planet Earth from the bondage of sin to the freedom of life that would only be available by appropriating the Messiah 
as your personal safe. Remember we talked on Saturday about the Afi Coleman was this bag that had three compartments in it and it had this matzah bread and that, you know, the father at, at the Passover would wrap it in linen just like yeah, Jesus yeah. was wrapped in linen and it was striped just like Jesus was striped after being whipped and it was pierced just like Jesus was pierced in his hands and his feet while he was up on the cross and then wrapped in linen just like he was when he was buried and then you would go and hide the matzah bread um, and then the kids at the Passover Seder would have to go find the hidden, wrapped in linen, piece of matzah, which is a symbol mm -hmm. of the body of Jesus after it was crucified. And only the kid who finds it can bring it back to the Father to get the prize. And if you're the kid that found it, look, look, I found it. And when this forbid, you unwrap the linen and the matzah bread, which is a symbol of the crucified Jesus, you get a prize. Oh, uh, a, a, a treat, a, a gift. However you want to look at it, it was God's way of teaching the nation of Israel and the children in the nation of Israel that by finding the Messiah individually and personally, only then can you receive the reward from God the Father, which is eternal life. And so we found out then that one of the strange ceremonies that started the whole Passover, which now, if this is 32 AD, the Passover is now starting right now. Now we're sitting down and the Passover lamb which got slaughtered at 3 p.m. this afternoon, it has now been baked and now we're eating it, which is the beginning of the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And now the uh, high priest, Annas and Caiaphas, are now at their homes respectively eating the Passover. Why? Because they didn't go into Pilate's house a few hours earlier, earlier this morning at 6 a.m. because that would have ritually uh, you know, un you know, ceremonially made them unclean. They wouldn't have been able to sit down and eat the Passover. But because it was the preparation for the Passover that Jesus did his Last Supper, that when Jesus is being placed on trial, that is prior to the actual Passover. And so we learn Exodus chapter 12 that after you kill the, the Passover lamb on Nisan 14, which you brought into your house on Nisan 10, Jesus presenting himself on Palm Sunday, that's Nisan 10, the presentation, the observation for four days. And after four days observation, when you pass muster, you kill him and you take the blood and you put the blood on the door of your house, but you do it in the form of a cross. So you put, boom, on the lintel and on the two door posts. If you draw a straight line through the blood, boom. What is that? What's that? That's a cross, Steve. Look at that. How on earth did Moses, when he's putting this crazy stuff down in Exodus 12, know that the cross would be significant? He didn't. Yeah, no Crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. We talked about that on Saturday, how, you know, uh, the Phoenicians sort of invented it as a form of torture and used it on the Carthaginians. And when the Carthaginians, during the, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the Carthaginian War with, with the Phoenicians won, and then they eventually went to war with Rome, which was the new kid on the block during the Punic Wars, the Carthaginians would crucify the Romans, and it was such a popular form of execution and torture, Rome adopted it to use against their enemies after they defeated Carthage, but said the Roman Senate that it's such a barbaric form of execution that it's illegal to use it against Roman citizens, which is why, by the way, parenthetically, that Paul, killed by the Romans, was beheaded, decapitated, because he was also a Roman citizen because he was born in the city of Tarsus in Cilicia, which was a Roman province, meaning that even though he was born a Jew, he was also born with dual citizenship as a Roman as well by virtue of where he was born. So it was illegal for Paul to be crucified, so he had to be decapitated, whereas Peter, who was you know born and raised in, you know, uh, in the area of, uh, I guess, uh, well, let's see, his fishing business was in uh, the northern part of Israel, around the Sea of Galilee, and so that made him, you know, uh, respectively a, you know, Judean Samaria, the northern uh, sections of Israel. Um, and so um, Peter, unlike Paul, didn't have dual or joint citizenship, and so he could be crucified. So Jesus gets crucified, Peter gets crucified, Paul gets decapitated. But, I, you know, I, I, I say way away. So you see the blood is in the form of a cross on the door. And then let's take a look at the chart that I've, I've sort of made up for you that lays out, based on Sir Robert Anderson's computations, The Coming Prince is the name of the book that he wrote in the late 1800s, does an excellent job of 
tying together all the mathematicals to show that the 69 weeks of Daniel was completed on Nisan 10, 32 AD. And that is the only one of the dates um, in this section of time. You know, because of seven days in the week, uh, the, for instance, if Christmas falls on Saturday this year, next year it'll be, you know, Friday, and the next year it'll be Thursday, and the next year it'll be Wednesday, and, you know, it rotates every seven years, it'll be on a Saturday. Every seven years it'll be on a Monday. Every seven years it'll be on a Tuesday. And the same is true with the Passover, which follows the cycles of the moon. So we find out that for the gospel to make sense when it says he had to be taken down from the cross because the Sabbath was about to begin, we now find out we're, we're, we're locked in, Steve, by the, yep. by the verse you just read. If we're going to be biblical students, unless we're going to concede that the Bible has some errors in it, Jiminy Christmas, if we do that, and we concede, well, the Bible was wrong about the three days and three nights. Jesus, he meant well, but he wasn't mm -hmm. totally perfect. And that means he's also not God. And that means he can't die for our sins because if he's imperfect, he can't be the substitutionary sacrifice. He can't be the second man, the last Adam, because he's not absolutely perfect. So if Jesus goes out of his way to tell us in Matthew 12, verse 40, that he's going to spend three days and three nights in the heart of earth, then we got to figure out, is the Bible wrong? Is Jesus wrong? Or, or is both the Bible and Jesus, the Bible says God the Father, places the word even above his own name. So we can't accept that either Jesus or the Bible is wrong, or we might find out the Bible's wrong about born again salvation, and we're all on our way to hell and God made a mistake about us trusting in Jesus, and you know, then we have no hope. So, again, if we understand that the idiom or the term Sabbath can mean, and normally, typically, usually means, the time from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, the normal Jewish Saturday Sabbath, because the first day of the week, under the law of Moses, is Sunday, not Monday like it is here in the West mm -hmm. under the Roman calendar that we use, but the first day of the week under the biblical rules of the nation of Israel is Sunday, which means the last day of the week is the day of the Sabbath. So Sunday is not the Sabbath. It wasn't changed. The Christian church didn't change the Sabbath. Sunday is the day that the church recognizes the resurrection of Jesus and it's the day that typically we would take communion, which is a re-representation of not the Passover itself, but of the communion, which is instituted at the Last Supper on the preparation for the Passover. Like, you might go to church on a Sunday, and the term go to church is, is really sort of a modern Western idiom, yeah. where you go to a building. Really, the church is where you, is the gathering together of the saints, but it's come to mean like going to a religious building and having a ceremony, and oft times, maybe once a month, or in some places once every couple of weeks, you'll have a communion service where you remember the crucifixion uh, and resurrection of Jesus. And so, if we understand then that the term Sabbath can usually almost always means the Saturday Sabbath, which is the last day of the week, the day of rest for the Jews, but it can also be used to make reference to a special whole highly high holy day, which is what John clarifies for it. It's referred to um, you know as the Sabbath, but then John says, but that Sabbath was an high day. I Meaning it wasn't the normal Saturday Sabbath, it was a special super elite religious day, which by the way, the Passover, which was arguably the holiest day of the year was the most special of the big three special, you know, high holy days. The Passover, which initiated the beginning of the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread, that was considered or called a special Sabbath. It can be called a high holy day or a special Sabbath. The Saturday Sabbath isn't a special Sabbath, except for once every seven years when the Passover falls on the regular Saturday Sabbath. But on the year that Jesus was crucified, and uh, seven years prior to that, and seven years after that, it fell the day before the Sabbath. So let's take a look at it. In 25 AD, the Passover fell on a Friday, which was the day before the regular Saturday Sabbath. 
we have that right there. So I made the chart so that we can see, oh, this will explain the time that Jesus spent in the tomb and why the Good Friday scenario is inaccurate. And so, okay, so if in 25 AD, the Passover was the day before the Saturday Sabbath, then that means the next year in 26 AD, the Passover and the Sabbath overlapped, meaning that the Passover, the special Sabbath, fell on the day of the regular Saturday Sabbath. And so the very next year, uh, you know, Passover fell on a Sunday, the day after the Saturday Sabbath. And then in 29 AD, it's on a Tuesday. Uh, 30 AD, Passover is on a Wednesday. 31 AD, Passover is on a Thursday. Getting close. And then the very next year, 32 AD, which is the day that we're locked into because of the prophecy related to the 69 weeks of years or 483 years to the day where Sir Robert Anderson did all the mathematics and looked at all the, you know, the lunar calendars and all of that Greenwich Mean Time in London, England, and was able to determine that 32 AD was the day that the 173,080th day, 880th day or the 69th week of Daniel would have fallen, which means what? that four days after that, the Messiah has to be crucified. So Messiah can't be crucified in 31 AD or 33 AD because it won't work. It has to be a crucifixion of the Messiah four days after the Messiah presents himself on the 69th week of Daniel. That's why Bible prophecy is so important. It encourages us relating to the second coming of Christ, but it also ties in all of these mathematical computations that are historically backed which prove that the Bible is the Word of God. So in 32 AD, what happens? We find out then uh, on, in 32 AD, you would have had that Sunday, which would be right here, that would be Nisan 10, if you count 4, 11, 12, 30, 40, uh-oh, you get a Thursday, Nisan 14, which was April 6 in our calendar. So in 32 AD, April 6, 32 AD, it's also under the Jewish calendar, Nisan 14 of uh, 32 AD, exactly four days after the 69th week of Daniel, the day of the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, which occurs right here. You have to count four days over, right, from Nisan 10, because you don't kill the Passover lamb until you do the four days ritual observation. So you bring him in on Nisan 10, and then you crucify him, or you, you, you ritually sacrifice the Passover lamb on Nisan 14. So, when Jesus is put on the cross at 9 a.m., and he's up there to 3 p.m., and not taken down to 3 p.m., it's at the same time the Passover lambs throughout the land of Israel are being ritualistically slain to be the Passover, which will begin after sundown the very next day. Remember, the next day starts not at midnight, next day starts at sundown. So now the sun went down. So when we started talking, Nisan 14, now that it's dark outside, it's now Nisan 15. So Jesus is on the cross today, if this is 32 AD, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And he's getting buried from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. The Passover lambs are being cooked up in the ovens throughout the land of Israel. And at about seven o'clock or so, you know, after sundown, the Passover is now being served up. Jesus is now already in the grave. So he's already got one of his days and one of his nights beginning in the tomb. And so special Sabbath counts as a Sabbath. So where scripture says they had to take him down from the cross because they didn't want to leave them up on the cross because the Sabbath was about to begin. It wasn't the Friday going into Saturday Sabbath that was about to begin, meaning it wasn't Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. that Jesus was on the cross. Uh-oh, Saturday's about to begin at sundown. No, it was the special Sabbath, which in 32 AD fell on a Friday. So that Friday Sabbath, which normally wouldn't be a Passover, wouldn't be a Sabbath, it was in 32 AD. It was the special Sabbath, also known as An High Day, which was the Passover beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So that's why Jesus' legs were about to be broken. They broke the legs of the thief on the cross to the left and the right of him. Why? Because that would speed up the death uh, by asphyxiation. 
Crucifixion was a form of execution, but it was also a form of torture to send a message to the enemies of Rome. So if you were a strong person with a strong physical constitution, you might be hanging on a cross for several days, maybe even weeks, you know, before you died. And so since the Passover was about to begin, or the Sabbath was about to begin, which is the special Sabbath of the Passover, was about to begin at sundown, they broke the legs of the thief on the left and right of Jesus to make sure, so they couldn't push up. That's how you would breathe. You were hanging there, and because you were hanging in that position, your diaphragm couldn't go up and down, and you couldn't breathe. So you would push up on the nails in your feet, suck in a breath, which would be excruciatingly painful, and then you drop back down to take the pressure off your feet and hold your breath. And then when you couldn't bear it anymore, you'd have to push up on the nails to get the diaphragm to be able to drop to get another breath, and you would go back and forth, back and forth, until your heart gave out from stress, and you'd have a heart attack and die. You know, mechanical asphyxiation. But if you broke the person's legs, their legs would lose the ability to press up. You just wouldn't have the, you know, the pain from the broken bones would immobilize the muscle and you wouldn't be able to press up anymore. So you would basically suffocate to death within minutes after having your legs broken. So they went up to Jesus to break his legs and they said, oh, wait, he's already dead. Don't break his legs. Why did that happen? Because Exodus chapter 12 said, you can't break a bone of the Passover lamb. Got to make you can pierce it and you can strike it, but you can't break any bones. And so Jesus, because he was the Passover lamb, though his legs should have been broken, right along with the other two guys on the cross, his legs weren't broken because God wanted the Bible to be fulfilled literally to the T. And that fulfills the prophecies related to um, Exodus chapter um, 12 that says that the bones of the Passover lamb would not be broken. And that's why, even to this day, in the Passover Seder, which was just celebrated this past Saturday, um, in fact, my friend, oh, I mean, Kevin Sutherland, you know, he, I got a text from, you know, from, from his wife. So, like, you know, I used their Passover Seder as an example of one of the Christian Seders I went to. And they said, oh, yeah, we're doing that tonight, as a matter of fact. So it turns out, to this very day, people, both Jews and Gentiles, are acknowledging the Jewish Passover Seder as a annual event that is to be celebrated. But it was at one of those events that I learned that, you know, the Passover lamb, the, the shank that's presented, a shank bone is presented at the Passover Seder, and you can't break it because it says in Exodus chapter 12, it's not supposed to be broken. We don't know why it's not supposed to be broken, but it is, so don't break it. And it's because it says in both Exodus chapter 12, and in Psalm, uh, I think it's Psalm 36, that talks about the crucifixion where it talks about, um, you know, the Messiah not uh, having his bones broken. So you can take a look at those and we'll run through those with the time we have left. But let's get back to our chart. So then we would find out then that the Bible is correct then if you could refer to um, the Passover as a special Sabbath, then that verse in the Bible that says, well, they had to take the bodies down from the cross and they didn't break Jesus' legs because he was the Passover lamb, so they weren't allowed to break his legs. So they stuck a spear in his side and blood and water came out, which means the heart had already stopped pumping. And therefore, oh, goodness forbid, uh, he's already dead. We don't need to break his legs. So he's taken down from the cross and he's buried. So that gives him one day in the tomb already. And then the sun goes down. Now the Passover, which is that Friday special Sabbath begins. Now he's got one night in the tomb. And then the next day is the regular Saturday Sabbath. And then the day after that is the first day of the week for the Jews, Sunday. That explains why when Mary Magdalene and the other women, you know, went out on Sunday, they went out early before sunrise even with spices and ointments because they weren't able to ritualistically prepare the body for decay, which is putting on all these, you know, myrrh and aloes and all kinds of stuff. So the body won't stink so much when it's decaying. And they couldn't do it because it takes several hours to do it. And the Sabbath was about to begin. Not the Saturday Sabbath, but the special Sabbath of the Passover Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so we find out that Mary Magdalene gets to the tomb before sunrise. The 400 pound stone was already removed. And I drew a picture of it right there. And when she looked in, Jesus was gone. But the linens that is symbolized even to this day in the Passover Seder was there. 
and the head cloth, the burial cloth. It's been described, I've, I've looked at a, you know, a couple of different uh, descriptions of what that, that wrapping, ceremonial wrapping of a dead body would have been like. One person says it's dipped in a certain kind of paste and you would wrap it around the body and then you have a separate headpiece wrapped around the head and that certain um, uh, like ointments, a glue would be, it's almost like, it's almost like a mummification where you wrap the body and put like paste or glue on it to make the gauze or the linen stick to the body so that it wasn't a case that when Mary Magdalene looked in the tomb, there was sometimes we see in depictions like, like Franco Zeffirelli did an excellent you know, depiction of the gospel of Jesus in Jesus of Nazareth, which was a made for television movie in 77. But at the end, you saw the linen clothes kind of laid out, like mm -hmm. draped along the slab where the body was laying. Yeah. That's not probably how it really appeared. What probably appeared was like a cocoon, you know, mm -hmm. like when a caterpillar crawls out of his cocoon, you have like the, the crust or the yeah. shell mm -hmm. of where the body was. So you, you probably had like a paper mache like cast of wow. the body of Jesus, which was empty, <laughs> as well as the headpiece, exactly. which means that when Jesus came out, not only of the tomb, but came out of the burial wrappings, he passed directly through the material, meaning he didn't just wake up. He swooned was one of the theories. He passed out, and then he woke up and unwrapped himself and walked out. Uh-uh. He passed through the material, wow. which no normal human being could do unless they can de-atomize and re-atomize themselves, which means Jesus was now in his supernatural resurrection body, and he passed right through the burial materials, which they found intact in the tomb before sunrise. So, stated another way. Okay, let's take a look at my second chart. The Thursday crucifixion of Jesus, not the Friday, and I'm not, you know, being a pain in the butt just because I'm trying to spite the Catholic Church or, or traditional uh, Protestant Christianity, even though we all, you know, had Good Friday, we all acknowledged good, we got out of school uh, mm -hmm. on Good Friday, the stores were closed, and, and I were Michigan on Good Friday, and always appreciated Good Friday. But, it should have been Good Thursday Thursdays. instead, because here, here we go. Here's my other chart. We got Exodus chapter 12 that lays out for you that the Passover lamb has to be brought into the home on Nisan 10 and then sacrificed on Nisan 14 with the blood being put on the door of the house um, in the form of a cross. It doesn't say in the form of a cross, but if you, you, you literally apply it the way it's told for you to apply it in Exodus 12, you put it there, there, and there, and draw a straight line through it. And that gives you the sign of a cross, which meant nothing to Moses at the time. And by the way, parenthetically, there are verses in uh, Numbers chapter 2, I think it is, that says Israel marched through the wilderness, camping out in the form or in the shape, if you were in a helicopter looking down, in the form of a cross as they marched through the desert. Now, they didn't do it on purpose because they didn't know what it was all about. It was God supernaturally putting into the Old Testament the fact that the whole purpose for Jesus coming to earth, all the promises of the Messiah was for him to come to die for the sins of man, to become the second man, the last Adam to reverse the curse of the original man, the first Adam. And then if you look at Hebrews chapter 9, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. John chapter 13, 14, 18, and 19 lays out for us all the details related to the crucifixion. 32 AD, the special Passover Sabbath and the regular Saturday Sabbath were contiguous, which happens every seven years. So Jesus would have had to have been crucified either in 25 AD, 39 AD, or 32 AD. But because of the 69 weeks of Daniel prophecy and the fact that Artaxerxes Longimanus gave that prophecy on Nisan 10 of 445 BC to restore and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem is okay, thus saith me, uh, Artaxerxes Langemanus, the great leader of Media Persia. Mm -hmm. From that day forward, now Daniel tells us in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 26, you have to count forward 360 day years, um, a 24 hour period of time, mm -hmm. and if you count forward 383, uh, uh, 360 day years, that will lead you up to Sir Robert Anderson's coming prince, did all the mathematical computation. Nissan 10, 32 AD, which was April 6th of 32 AD. And so that means 
Messiah has to be crucified within four days of that date. So if the end of the 69 weeks of Daniel was on Nisan 10 of 32 AD, then Jesus can't be crucified in 25 AD or 39 AD, even though you have the contiguous uh, special Sabbath, regular Sabbath, back to back. If you crucify Jesus in 31 or 33 AD, the other popular dates that I see, you again have the same problem because in 32 AD, in 33 AD and in 31 AD, if it says we had to take him down from the cross because the Sabbath was about to begin, then it has to be talking about the Saturday Sabbath in 31 AD and 33 AD. And then you've got the other problem that we start out with because Matthew chapter 12 verse 40 says, I'm going to spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And Dave Hunt did a great teaching on it. He said, no way, if you look at the chart, and I made it a chart here to make it a lot easier. No, even if you consider part of a day a full day, there's no way you're going to get three days and three nights from a Friday crucifixion. Let's try that. Here's, here's Friday. If Jesus is crucified on the regular Friday and that the Sabbath being referred to is the regular Saturday Sabbath, then here's the crucifixion, and here's your resurrection. Your resurrection is before sunrise on Sunday, Nissan 17. So here's the crucifixion. One, two. At best, you can get two. Here you go. One, two. So you get really one day of, 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 of night and two days of day from the Friday crucifixion. But if we go with what Sir Robert Anderson's In the Coming Prince Calculations have confirmed unquestionably, uh, and that book is almost 200 years old now, um, Jesus being arrested. Let's start out. You know, Jesus shares the Last Supper. We'll look at that with the 12 apostles in the upper room, the upper room discourse. I'd say from about 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. when dessert's say, you know, the cognac and cigar rolls around and all that. Oh, wait, they, they, they didn't smoke any cigars and they weren't drinking cognac. But if they were, you know what I'm saying, that's, a, you know, you'd have the main course first and then you have dessert and then, you know, the cognac and cigars and the guys would kick it around and, and be talking about sports. That would happen, you know, between 4 and 10 p.m. So Jesus shares his Last Supper, which wasn't the Passover, it was the preparation for the Passover, Christmas Eve, to use an idiom, um, with the 12 apostles in the upper room, starting at about 4 p.m. on Nisan 13. At about 7 p.m., the sun goes down, so when the main course is being served, which is the Last Supper Jesus has with the disciple, the clock clicks over to Nissan 14. Now we're in that special yeah. Nissan 14 day. Uh-oh, that's when Passover lamps got to be presented the next day um, at, at the temple. So here's your upper room discourse, your last supper on Nissan 13 and Nissan 14. And then on Nissan 14 now, uh, the last supper ends. Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and prays because he knows that the wrath of God is about to fall upon him. And he's sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. Not because he's scared of being crucified the next day, but because he knows that the wrath of God, which will be equivalent to eternity in the lake of fire, times every man, woman, and child that's ever lived. I'm not God. I'm just a human being in a regular body. So I can't even really conceptualize how much suffering and agony that would be. I can conceptualize what it would be like for me to suffer agony in the lake of fire for a hundred years or a million years, but eternity in the lake of fire times everyone that's ever been born or ever will be born is now transmogrified into the space-time continuum into, into basically six hours, but because Jesus is God in human flesh and God the Father is outside the space-time continuum, he can pay that eternal debt because he's infinite. And he somehow did that. So you think the 20 billion people in the history of the world, the 30 billion people in the history of the planet Earth, from Adam to the end of the millennium, times eternity in the lake of fire. Eternity in the lake of fire heightened 20 billion times or 20 million billion fold. That's the suffering that Jesus suffered at the hands of the Father. And he knew it was coming. And that's why... He sweat as it were great drops of blood. That wasn't poetic license. It's actually a medical condition called hematidrosis. Hematidrosis is a condition where when the blood pressure in the heart um, is increased to such a level because there's stress in the heart, the more stress you're under, the harder and faster the heart beats. 
the small capillaries towards the surface of the skin can't take the pressure. It's just like if you put too much water through a water hose, a garden hose in your yard, it'll, it'll spring a leak. So your capillaries would spring leaks because the pressure was so great and blood would start to spurt out of the capillaries and they would run to whatever avenue to get out of the body, which would be your sweat glands. So the sweat glands, instead of removing sweat that would be able to flow out, any blood that flowed out of the capillaries into the interstitial tissues would come out through the sweat glands. You don't see it happening too much because by the time your heart gets that stressed out, you usually drop dead of a heart attack first. But if you've got a super, super strong heart like Jesus would, because he's the only perfect man ever to be born, he was able to take the stress without having a heart attack and dying, but his capillaries couldn't take the stress. So they split open and the blood came out of his sweat glands, sweat ducts, as great drops of blood because he was that stressed out about not dying on the cross. No, that was easy for him. It was facing the wrath of God when he became me. And God is looking at him as, as me instead of as Jesus. Uh-oh, <laughs> he's in big trouble. Yeah. I can tell you, he was in for it. So that's what Jesus was doing at about 1 in the morning in the Garden of Gethsemane on Nisan 14. And then Judas, knowing where they hang out, he betrays them to 30 pieces of silver in, in fulfilling a Bible prophecy. And Judas leads the regiment, not of Roman soldiers, but of the temple guard. Remember, the high priest Caiaphas wants him dead. Because really, his political authority and power and position is being threatened because the people are hailing him as the Messiah. Which means, one, at the very least, Rome was going to tear the temple down and take our authority away because we couldn't keep, you know, the masses in check. You got this guy running around claiming to be the king of the Jews. I can lose my job. Rome is really my employer, not God. Mm -hmm. I'm only doing this as sort of, sort of you, know, you know, Rome does the same thing with, with the Pope. I mean, he supposedly is a religious leader on behalf of the God of the Bible, but he's really, he's a politician. He's like the, one of the world's most influential political leaders. And so Caiaphas and Annas were those guys. And so here we are at about 3 a.m. Judas leads that regiment um, of temple guards to Jesus, kisses him on the cheek, has him placed under arrest. Jesus is now in the dark at 3 a.m. taken to the house of Annas, the former high priest, and put on trial. This is illegal because you can't have a nighttime trial under the law of Moses. And so Annas, after finding him guilty of blasphemy, after you know questioning about being the son of God and Jesus using the I am for he sends him to Caiaphas. And Caiaphas has a trial at his house. And when he's placed on the road, I adjure you by the living God, don't give me, you know, beat around the bush answers. Tell me whether plainly whether you are the Messiah and the Son of God. I am. Not I am he, as you'll see added in italics in your King James Bible. Uh, just kind of scratch that out. Um, but again, as, as, as the scholar I was reading earlier said, you know, there isn't the, the infinitive uh, adjective, you know, he is an added to that phrase in the Greek. It's just the I am, which is Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, the divine name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jehovah's Witnesses, they're wrong about that, just like the Roman Catholics are wrong about the Friday crucifixion. Yeah. So we got to be biblically accurate because if somebody who's an enemy of the gospel knows the Bible as well, they can use the scriptures that you don't know against you to prove that the Bible is full of errors. So, okay, 3 a.m., Jesus is now arrested, put on trial by Annas, then taken to Caiaphas and put on trial again, and then after he says, I am, Caiaphas tears his clothes. What more do we need to hear from him? He's declared himself to be God. This is blasphemy. He should be put to death. Just like I told you guys two months ago, before he fooled around and raised Lazarus from the dead, now you got all the people following after him. If you killed him when I told you to, we wouldn't be having this problem. And so what well, Caiaphas, remember, we're under Roman occupation. You know, under Roman occupation rules, uh, Israel can still put a goat to death, but we can't put men to death anymore since 4 BC. He's like, oh, you're right. We got to take him to Pilate and get him to put him to death. So they take him over to Pilate's house, and Pilate, the governor, is, is awakened at about four in the morning, still nighttime out, mm -hmm. still dark out, Nissan 14. And he's saying, uh, what? He's like, this Galilean carpenter, Jesus, has come down here for the Passover, and he's stirring up trouble. And oh, he said, wait, it's Galilean? That's not. Oh, that's King Herod's jurisdiction. Take him over to his house, yeah. you know. And so Herod, and you know, let me, as, as we're going along, let me just show you a little diagram, just real quick. Take a look at the little trusty, dusty diagram for you. 
and you can freeze the camera and look at it at your leisure. And that's the diagram of where Jesus was and where all this stuff kind of played itself out at. And there you go. Hopefully you guys can see that. You got Caiaphas' house. And you got the Garden of Gethsemane over here. And all of this occurs right in this little area. You see Jesus' trial and um, he's being ferried back and forth. So all of this can happen. So after Herod can't get the magic trick, he sends him back to Pilate. And then Pilate questions him some more, tries to get him off the hook. And he sends him out to be beaten and brings him back, questions him some more. And then, you know, after two or three trials with Pilate, he basically says, I have the power to release you and have you crucified. And Jesus says, you know, uh, no, you have no power with me at all unless it was granted you from above. Therefore, those that delivered you, me to you have the greater sin. And Pilate goes out of his way to exonerate Jesus once again, washes his hands, puts it up to a vote. When they vote for Barabbas instead of Jesus to be set free, Pilate says he's innocent. It's not my fault. It's on you guys. And Jesus is then condemned to be crucified. Now it's about six in the morning. And so about six in the morning, till about nine, he's being beaten up by the Roman centurions at this point. The cross is being constructed and his beard is being torn out and all the terrible things that we read about when doing before the crucifixion, which now begins at about nine o'clock on Nisan 14, he's now on the cross. And he's up there at about 12 noon. The sun goes black. God causes a solar eclipse from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. During that period of time between 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock, guess what's happening throughout the land of Israel? The Passover lambs throughout the land of Israel are being sacrificed and killed. At the same time, Jesus is being sacrificed and killed. And so we get to 3 p.m. and an amazing thing happens several amazing things, but because we're running out of time, and I'm in, in determined to, to make this not a two and a half hour mega fest like last year, I had to try to squeeze many things into one because we lost one of our videos. But one of the most amazing things that's happening is that at about 3 p.m., right at the end, Jesus says, remember at noon, when the sun went dark, he was like, uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now he's under the wrath of God, and he's not even referring to uh, Yahweh as his father anymore. Now he's not in a father-son relationship. Now he's in, you know, uh, condemned uh, judge, you know, the, the judge and the, and the condemned. Now he's paying the price for me and you and everybody out there, too. Um, paying it for you, too, so, you know, don't point the finger at me. Yeah. Not just me, it's you, too. Um, and so... He's now being punished for our sins outside the space-time continuum somehow squeezed into what appears on the planet Earth to be six hours. But from 12 noon till 3, it's darkness. Solar eclipse supernaturally occurs in the middle of the day. And there's one thing, you know, every 12 years there's a solar eclipse and if you look through like a telescope, you can kind of see a shadow. Yeah. But it's another thing for it to be bright and sunny out and then five minutes later it's completely dark. That doesn't happen even during the most dramatic of the solar eclipses. And that's what happens from 12 to 3. And so at 3 p.m. now, Jesus now lifts up his head and he says something else on the cross. Now, only now he says this. He says, to tell us thy. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It is accomplished, um, is what it reads in the English. But in the Greek textus receptus, the phrase he uses there is to tell us thy. To tell us thy was a Greek accounting term that people in commerce and business um, would use in transactions. In fact, Matthew, who was also known as Levi, was a tax collector. So when Matthew wrote out the receipt for the bill that he was collecting from the Jews, which is why he couldn't go into the temple, he couldn't go into synagogue, because he was considered impure, because he was a tax collector for the foreign occupying power, um, Rome. But on the bill, after you paid him in shekels or in fish or whatever it is you were paying, He'd write to tell us die, which means your bill is paid in full. And so Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, used that particular term. Why? Why is he using an accounting term to say paid? Because God wants us to know that Jesus' death on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. paid it off. From the fall in the garden of the original Adam, the first man, 
all the way through every one of the children of men that has ever lived and ever will live or be born through the millennium will now be paid in full by the second man who is what? The last Adam, which is Jesus on the cross because he's the Passover lamb. When the other Passover lambs throughout the nation of Israel, which are a type of Jesus being crucified, are being killed, Jesus is being killed too in 32 AD. So he says, Tetelestai is accomplished into thy hands. I commit my spirit. And then the Bible says he dismissed his spirit. If he had wanted to, one writer said, he'd be hanging on the cross till today. If he hadn't given permission for his spirit to die, but he did, and he went down to earth to the peoples of the past. He went down to Hades, preached the gospel to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Nebuchadnezzar, and all those guys waiting for him. I'm the Messiah. Do you accept me or not? All right, sign me up. Yeah. And then he led him up into heaven, and there you go. Um, he's doing that during the three days and three nights in the earth. Um, but what, what else happens at 3 p.m.? Two other supernatural events that you'll get in one of the gospels. John doesn't really focus on it uh, as much, but one of the incredible things is that an earthquake occurs. Earthquake occurs right on cue as if you would almost think that God is orchestrating on. My son just died for the sins of the world. Dun, 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 dun. Instead of having trumpets blowing, a great earthquake occurs during the solar eclipse and the earthquake breaks open the graves of many people this is one of the supernatural ones that doesn't get nearly as much credit. You never see this depicted in any of the movies about the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus. The earthquake shakes open the graves of many of the saints that had died prior to Jesus from decades earlier, and they get up out of the graves and they walk into the city of Jerusalem. So like it's Uncle Remus from you know 20, I was at your funeral ten years ago. You're back. Yeah. You know, I, I was down in Hades in, in Abraham's bosom. Next thing you know, here I am. And so God caused people that were faithful to come back to life when Jesus died. Why? To send the message to all of us, to Jerusalem. The, the wit eyewitnesses would write this down mm -hmm. so that we could read it later, To show that Jesus' death on the cross paid it all. Wow. Dead people came back to life. And also, and maybe more importantly, in the temple itself. The veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the inner Holy Sanctum and the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant used to reside and that the presence of God would dwell. And then once a year, the priest would go in there. Remember, he had tied a rope around his ankle and he would pour blood on the Day of Atonement on the mercy seat. And if he had any hidden sin, God might strike him dead and they'd have to pull him out by the ankle by the rope. Because if you went in to get the body, God strike you dead too. And so it was this high holy thing that the righteousness of God is so powerful that goodness forbid, you know, you, you know, they had to put a veil, which was basically a gigantic curtain, mm -hmm. but not a curtain like you think of hanging in a window made of silk, a curtain that was about three and a half feet thick, right. not wide. It was probably, you know, a hundred feet wide and 300 feet high, but it was about three feet of material thick so that nobody could accidentally look through and get, get themselves killed by accident. It was like a thermonuclear reactor behind a curtain. We need a, a thick shielding of lead to prevent us from being uh, ionized by the incredible power that's on the other side of the curtain. When Jesus was crucified at three o'clock at the end of the six hours, not only did an earthquake occur, but the veil in the Holy of Holies of the temple tore, not from the bottom to the top, meaning no man tore it, but from the top down, separating the two sides, you know, the, the curtain in the two, and letting us now look in to the Holy of Holies, which what? Symbolized the fact that Yahweh, God the Father, has accounted Jesus' death on the cross enough to now allow man to have direct access to God the Father without a priest, without a blood sacrifice of an animal, without some curtain separating us. Meaning now, because of the death of Jesus on the cross, we can have immediate access directly to the throne of grace. Us sinful men that even Moses had to be placed in the cleft of the rock as the hinder parts of God passed by so that Moses wouldn't be killed instantaneously on Mount Sinai by the glory of the Lord because we are so impure. So that's what the blood of Jesus does. So people rose from the dead and walked into the city of Jerusalem and the veil of the temple was torn into and then a few years after that God allowed the temple to be destroyed to force Israel 
to now turn to his only begotten son as the Passover lamb, as the blood sacrifice. Because now, even though in modern day Israel and throughout the world, Jews all over, they will, you know, uh, celebrate Passover as they did this past Saturday um, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. But where's the blood sacrifice? You're supposed to have a, a blood sacrifice. Where's the Passover lamb that you have to offer up at the temple? There is no temple. There is no blood sacrifice anymore. They've gone many days, though, the Old Testament prophet said, without, a, without a, 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 a temple, without a sacrifice. And so now the sin debt has been piling up for 2,000 years since the temple was destroyed. So eventually, Israel's going to be forced to turn to Jesus alone, especially when after the temple's rebuilt, Antichrist goes into it and declares himself to be God. They're going to realize this is a scam, this can't be the Messiah, and then they're going to turn to Jesus. And Jesus' prophecy, which he gave on Nisan 10, of 32 AD when he had to knock down drag out with the Pharisees in the temple after he presented himself on the 69th week of Daniel he said you will not see me here again not until you learn to cry blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord for I and my father are one and the same and it was, oh, awesome. it was killing this guy and so here we are on my chart getting back to the chart so Jesus is being crucified at the same time as Passover lambs throughout the land of Israel slaughtered and now he's in the grave Prior to sundown on Nisan 14. So you go one, two, three days, one, two, three nights. So you can get three days and three nights from his crucifixion. Because remember, he gets up. He's resurrected before sunrise. Or it will be three nights and four days. It will be four days and three nights in the earth if he arose at sunrise. And so sometimes you see on, on a Sunday, I just I was at the gym and I saw that one of the churches down the street, uh, you know, used to attend one of the Calvary chapels, and sunrise service, I've been to that one before, uh, right on Miami Beach at sunrise, you know, you, they do baptism, they do a sunrise service. And when I was a kid, back in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I went to a Pentecostal church, and my, you know, um, you know, some family members, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, uh, went to, right down the street at the park, there was this very cool Easter Sunday, we would call it, sunrise service. Why? Because Jesus rose at sunrise. No, we find out that, as you point out, Stephen said, Mithras and Mithraism, which is this ancient Persian religion that really stems from ancient Babylon and the Babylonian paganism of the sun god worship and worshiping the queen of heaven, his consort, the fertility goddess Semiramis, who was later called Ishtar by the Phoenicians, Isis by the Egyptians, and Estra, or Asteroth by uh, Sidonians and Phoenicians, and one of the derivations of the name Ishtar is Easter. Mm. And so Easter is sort of an anglicized pronunciation of Ishtar, who was the fertility goddess of the sky. And bunny rabbits, which we would, we would go to church as a kid, and, and, and all the kids on Easter yeah. Sunday we wear our little suits and whatever, you know, and our little clip-on suspenders. Remember that? And pictures, you, yeah. Right, pictures. So, oh, like, my goodness, it's so embarrassing. You know, you got my little suspenders on and my buck shoes, and my sister got the, the knee socks. And if we were good during Sunday school, there would be an Easter egg hunt in the church uh, parking lot in, 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 in the, on the lawn mm -hmm. in, in the church property. And there'd be a sunrise service, and then we, oh man, it was a good year. You get a Cadbury chocolate bunny. <laughs> now you always wonder why were there painted eggs, and how is that related to Easter and the resurrection of Jesus? Because Rome, when it took over the church yeah. of Jesus Christ, based in the city of Rome in 325 AD, and then spread it throughout the Roman Kingdom or the Roman Empire, and syncretized the state wow. with the church, creating the first state church system now known as Roman Catholicism. They brought in the paganism of Ishtar or Isis or Easter worship, the fertility sky goddess, and that was symbolized by eggs that were painted different colors and bunnies, Easter bunnies, because bunnies reproduce rapidly. And so the bunny was a symbol of the sexual prowess of Ishtar, Easter, and how she could produce all kinds of awful without even having to you know you know uh, regular uh, you know sexual activity she was super fertile because she was the fertility sky goddess and she could give birth spontaneously so we find out that those pagan implements were syncretized into the church and made part of a recognition of in the book of Acts 
What we did is we would recognize the resurrection of Jesus yeah. on the first day of the week, which was Sunday. It wasn't the Sabbath. The Sabbath was still Saturday. Sunday was the day of acknowledgement of the resurrection of Jesus because it symbolized a new day, a new week. Sunday was the first day of a new week. And so it was a day of new beginnings. And so the resurrection of Jesus was a symbolization of a new beginning, a new life. And so the Jews who made up 100% of the church in the early days of the church after the resurrection, they still had a Saturday Sabbath, but then Sunday was the day that you acknowledged the resurrection of Jesus, the New Beginnings Day. And so there were no Easter bunnies or Easter eggs as part of the Book of Acts in the church. That didn't happen until Rome syncretized Babylonian paganism with its sky god worship, Ishtar, Semiramis, uh, Easter, all the same, Oestra, some people will call her. Those were all syncretized in from 325 AD onward, and they remain into this very day. That's why we need to separate it. It's not like you're gonna, if you're born again, you're going to hell if you acknowledge Good Friday as the day Jesus was crucified, but it's biblically inaccurate. And if you get an enemy of God, they're gonna make the Bible a lie or Jesus a lie, and then it's gonna make you look bad if you don't have an explanation. So I'm giving it to you yeah. so that you'll be able to confront error in the Bible. Now somebody's gonna say, oh, ha uh -huh. but I got proof now the King James Bible is wrong because in the book of Acts, it refers to Easter in the book of Acts related to the resurrection of Jesus. And you're right, it does say Easter in the book of Acts. But Peter was supposed to be put to death after Easter because the, you know, the, the governor under, un, under Roman control at the time didn't want to upset the crowd that was in town for the Passover and said, see, Easter and Passover are the same. No, it's because the Romans who were going to have to authorize and do the killing of Peter were waiting until after their springtime festival, which was the Feast of Ishtar which was celebrated long before Jesus was crucified. The Feast of Ishtar was always a springtime celebration because they were nature worshipers. Mm -hmm. Spring would represent the fertility of Ishtar, Semiramis, Isis, Easter. And so just like Passover and Resurrection Sunday sometimes fall on the same day, and just like Passover, and the regular Saturday Sabbath sometimes will fall on the same day. Sometimes Ishtar or Easter, the pagan spring fertility cult, right, mm -hmm. also will sometimes fall contiguous or at the same time as the Jewish feast of the Passover and the now uh, biblical Christian uh, recognition of Resurrection Sunday. Sometimes they all fall on the same day. And every year, they all fall in the same neighborhood. It's always in the spring. You always have Ishtar Easter, Passover, and Resurrection Sunday. It always falls in the springtime. And so sometimes they fall on the same day or back-to-back -back or within days of each other. So when the Book of Acts makes reference to Easter, it's making reference to that as the pagan Romans' right. springtime festival, whereas the Jews were celebrating um, the Passover, and the newborn followers of Christ were celebrating the resurrection of the Messiah or Resurrection Sunday. So they would celebrate Passover and Resurrection Sunday, whereas the Romans would celebrate Ishtar or Easter, as it's called in the New Anglicized form. So the Bible is not wrong and we can defend the faith. And if we can do that, we can get people to believe it. So here you go. Looking at our chart, here's our crucifixion, which would have happened earlier today. And now we're in Nisan 15. We are, are, are probably now just finishing up our Passover meal which is the first meal of the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And now we can go to the tomb and, and garnish the body of Jesus. No, nope, we can't because it's still the Passover. But then when the Passover ends, which would be after Friday ends, Nisan 16, you couldn't go to the tomb then because it's now Nisan 16, Saturday, which is your regular Sabbath, so you still can't do work, so you can't go back to the tomb and garnish it and put the things on it so that when it begins to decay, it won't smell bad. So you have to wait until the first day of the week, which for the Jews was Sunday, and in 32 AD was Nisan 17. So bright and early, Mary Magdalene went out because the body's gonna already be decaying, because we've been, it's been three days and three nights since 
you know, we put it in there. I got to get out there early. So she goes before sunrise. And when she gets to the tomb, before sunrise on Nissan uh, 17, which is Sunday of the week, she finds out that the tomb is already open and it's empty. Meaning Jesus didn't rise at sunrise. It means sometimes during that night, before the fourth day in the grave began, he was already out and about. So, no, Jesus didn't rise at sunrise. He rose before sunrise on Nisan uh, 17, which was a Sunday. Uh, Saturday is the Sabbath. Sunday didn't, Christians and Rome and the church didn't change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Saturday is the Sabbath under the Jewish law of Moses. Sunday is the first day of the week under the Jewish law. And Sunday is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. So it's the day that you acknowledge the resurrection of Jesus, which is the first day of the week under the Jewish calendar. So Jesus arose the first day of the week, Sunday, Nisan 17, but not with the sun, but prior to the sun. So he spent three days and three nights, not uh, four days and three nights, if he had risen with the sun. So sunrise ceremonies, it's not going to send you to hell, but just to be accurate, know that that sunrise ceremony really was an ancient yeah. pagan practice where you were worshiping Mithras, the god of the sun, and you were worshiping, the Egyptians called him, you know, Horus and, mm -hmm. and, and Isis, you know, uh, excuse me, Horus and Osiris, the sun god, and all of the Babylonian pagan dating all the way back from beyond Neo-Babylon to ancient Babylon, the Tower of Babel, mm -hmm. Nimrod, his wife Semiramis, and the mythos that arose from him dying and supposedly being reincarnated as the sun and then impregnating his wife Semiramis with a beam of sunlight causing her to spontaneously, supernaturally uh, conceive without sexuality a virgin-born God-man who they called Tammuz, who was a counterfeit of Jesus Christ and a type of the Antichrist. So Easter is Ishtar, Isis, the fertility sky goddess. Her implements or symbols are Easter eggs and bunnies. So a chocolate bunny on Easter, whether it be made by Cadbury or what's the other? Reese's. Reese's, whoever. Yeah. It's still paganism. Yeah, we used to have Easter baskets as yeah. kids at church. It was because of ignorance. People yeah. did things in ignorance because we didn't know any better. But now, the Bible says time is well spent yeah, yeah. to put away foolishness. Now that we know, tell the truth that you know so that people can know the things. And as we, I believe here we are, you know, now, now we come back from 32 N Nissan, 14 of 32 AD. Yeah. Now we come back to April 1st, 2021. I believe now that we're in April 1st, 2021, we are right at the end of the church era, which will then give way to the 70th week of Daniel. We've already done a series on the 69th week of Daniel. We looked at that last, last week when we looked at the triumphal entry mm -hmm. and Palm Sunday. That was the 69 weeks of Daniel, leaving one week left in the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy from Daniel chapter 9. That will be the tribulation period of seven years where Antichrist will rule upon the earth and it will be ended by the second coming of Christ, then he will establish himself as not only the king of the Jews, but the ruler of the planet Earth for 1,000 years here on the Earth, and then extend out from that seventh day. Remember, I was talking last week about the seven days of human history, the seven millennial days. God created the universe in six days, and on the seventh day he rested because he wanted to set an example for us to work six 24-hour days and then rest the seventh 24-hour day. That's why you have a Jewish Sabbath on Saturday, which is the last day of the week, and that's why Sunday is the first day of the week. But then there's an idiom that has supernatural and prophetic semblance of uh, the term the eighth day. Because there's no eight days in the calendar. Eighth day is an idiom that speaks of after the coming of the Messiah, after he reigns upon the earth for 1,000 years, and Jesus we learn in the book of Revelation, will reign from the city of Jerusalem in Israel for 1,000 years. If, as the Bible says in both the New, Old and the New Testament, God sees 1,000 years as a day and a day as 1,000 years, then you have the perfect 6,000 years of work as part of the six-day work week. And then, as it says in the book of Acts, there remains, therefore, a Sabbath day's rest 
for the people of the Lord. What's he talking about? He's not talking about the regular Saturday Sabbath or Sunday day of rest. He's talking about the 1,000 year millennial reign of Christ on the earth, which is the seventh day or the Sabbath day. Because when Jesus is ruling the world, you know, Jesus said, you know, the wisdom of God will cover the earth as waters cover the sea. It's going to be relaxing and resting. When Jesus is ruling the earth with a rod of iron, now this is probably aluminum, but it's the closest thing to iron. Jesus is going to be ruling the earth with a rod of iron. He's not going to allow sin. There's not going to be gay marriage. There's not going to be child rape. There's not going to be pornography. There's not going to be any of the things that makes the world evil that we have to fight against in our flesh. It'll be a time of rest for 1,000 years. And then... When that seventh day, which is the millennial day of rest, or the 1,000 year period when Jesus rules, which will be, for those of us that are his followers, a time of rest for us. Then, when that ends, what, what begins next? The eighth day. The idiomatic eighth day, which speaks of eternity. Eternity is the eighth day. And uh, Steve just made his, he, he did the symbol. Steve knows that for people involved in science and mathematics, that the symbol, if you go to a calculator or whatever, for infinity is the number eight turned on its side. Right. You know, the double circle. I don't think that that's a coincidence. I think it's symbolic of the eighth day is coming. The seventh day will come first, mm -hmm. but before that comes the 70th week of Daniel, the seven year period of time. But the church can't be here for that. The church will be gone in the rapture. There's a number of arguments as to why by the end of the springtime harvest festival, which will end, and by the way, it started with Passover. Passover, which we started Saturday, initiated the period of the Feast of Weeks. Seven units of seven weeks. 49 total days, the next day of which will be the 50th day after the Passover, is the day of Pentecost, hence the term Penta 50, sure, sure. which many people believe is tied into the rapture of the church. It's the day the church actually began. 50 days after the Passover, after Jesus was crucified, the church was filled with the Holy Spirit in that upper room, and they all began speaking tongues, of meaning foreign language from different parts of the world, even though they didn't know it. And that was the day that the church began in earnest. And some people believe that that emblematically is going to be the day, possibly, that the rapture would occur. And that because the whole prophecy related to 70 to 80 year generations, this being the 80th year after the reformation of the nation of Israel, March 14th, 1948. If that 80 years prophecy um, from uh, Psalm chapter 90 is, 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 is the accurate interpretation, then the argument is made that an 80 year rapture or 80 years after or the generation that sees Israel return to the nation uh, as a nation state on May 14th of 1948, 80 years from that would be 2021. So, that this would have to be, if that 80-year generation is, in fact, what God was intending in Psalm chapter 90, the rapture of the church, meaning the generation that sees all these things will see, you know, the, the, the rapture of the church, it would have to be this year. It would have to be during 2021. In which case, that means that, one, your time of labor is almost over if you're part of the church, if you're born again already. But it also means that your time of opportunity to preach the gospel and Jesus was you know last thing he said you know before you know um, he ascended he was like preach the gospel to all the nations baptizing in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit and go on with you even to the end of the age but what did he say he didn't say get clean drinking water solve global warming uh, uh, ice caps melting in Antarctica uh, you know uh, bring back the you know, the dodo bird from extinction find a cure to cancer or AIDS no he said preach the gospel Feed my sheep means teach the followers of Jesus doctrine. And that's what we're doing here. That's why I made all these silly charts and I'm drawing all these things to make it easier for you guys to understand the incredible truths in the Bible that are mathematically to the day absolutely computationally correct, even though they were written thousands of years in advance. So you get excited about it. And if you get excited about it, you start telling other people about it. And then you tie into that the gospel of Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, gospel of the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 3, specifically verses 16, 17, 18. Yeah. That's what Jesus said that we're supposed to do. That's the mission, the mission. It's not one of the missions of the church. It is the mission of the church. Preach the gospel so that people 
who believe it will be born again, and even after they're dead, they'll live again. Now, there's all these verses I could go into, but we just don't have the time, and I'm going to keep you guys, this is enough, we've gotten uh, one and three quarter hours, I talked as fast as I could, <laughs> so here we are. It's, it's, I know it's one of Steve's favorite teachings, that the Thursday crucifixion of Jesus, mm. I'll just briefly touch on, in the upper room discourse, let me just say this, Jesus had uh, not the Passover, but the preparation for the Passover meal. At that Last Supper, we found out some very important doctrinal truths, which I'll just give to you really quickly. He revealed...